Hi, my name is Joshua Lockman, and I'm a co-owner at Axe and Arrow Brewing. My name is Crystal Lockman. I'm one of the three co-owners of Axe and Arrow Brewing here in Glassboro, New Jersey. Greg Fletcher, head brewer here at Axe and Arrow Brewing. I got into brewing when I was in a little apartment in Denver and just doing uh, the little extract kits uh, on my apartment stove. I scorched more than one uh, stove, uh, and it just grew as a passion there. Uh, after that. The dream, that long-term project is always to open up a brewery, something that's a fun and productive business. When Josh and I had started speaking and brewing together, uh, that dream became a reality. Axe and Arrow came from a brainstorming session uh, between Greg and I. We both are part Scottish, so Fletcher is, you know, Greg's last name, so and Arrow came from that and Lockman, apparently an executioner, was known as a Lockman back in the 1200s, 1300s, so an axe. Greg said that, you know, axe and arrow, and it just flowed real, real good and sounded, sounded good. Our branding kind of comes more with similarities across uh, things. So we have our flight cards that we label our flights with, and they all have a graphic. The cards are kind of magic. The Gathering inspired. The beer nerds tend to be, you know, comic book nerds too, so they just love it. You know, my husband's a self-proclaimed nerd as well. <laughs> he he, uh, he really took the idea and kind of ran with it, and uh, it's worked out well for us. People people really love it. We offer everything from at IPAs down to Pilsners. Currently, we have on a uh, West Coast IPA, double IPA, Hellas Lager, a Bohemian Pilsner, a Hefeweizen, a Coffee Stout, a Scottish Wee Heavy, the American Pale Ale, the Jersey Pond Water, because everybody likes a good, easy drink in American Pale. They started brewing, and we started talking and pulling the numbers together. Um, by the time we went to the bank, it was probably March, April, May of 2018. Um, we secured the funding and you know, then start looking for property. We sit on a public town square, and the town square has events, and they probably do around 30 of them. So we felt that this location, just strictly on foot traffic, was the best. We signed our lease in September of 2018, and then started our federal process. We submitted everything. They had one question, I answered it immediately, and filed for licensing in the state of New Jersey in the beginning of December 2018. Um, started talks with them in January 2019 and opened our doors April 4th of 2019. When we initially rented the space, it was a brand new building, vanilla box as they call it, which was essentially just the exterior walls and the bath, the bathrooms. So we had to get an architect, do the design for the trench drains, the upgraded power, the tap room, the cold room. The space is just under 2,600 square feet. We have 11 foot ceilings. We actually had to tear out a part of the ceiling and raise it up to around, I think it's around 13 foot 10, so we could fit the chain hoist in and everything. My dad owns a sawmill, so bar tops, tabletops, and everything were actually made out of uh, locally reclaimed trees. I was actually able to build the bar. My stepbrother built the tables. We're actually using our smaller BX for our pilot system and we actually bought a second one which we use as our target range where we can try out new recipes, new beers, new ideas, experimentation. It's really nice to have the little system too to be able to do these small batches. You don't know how people are going to react and take to one of your beers. If you make 14 kegs, seven barrels, you're kind of stuck with that if it doesn't move. Whereas if you make half a barrel, you have one keg and if it doesn't move, it doesn't hurt as much to dump it. <laughs> doing my research over the internet on all sorts of different brewing systems. And when I came across the Bruja system, it just made a whole lot of sense. When we first started the planning, looking at doing five barrels, the advice that everybody always gives is oversize your equipment, make sure you're there, because if you don't, if you just plan on doing, uh, say, a one barrel system, you're going to be upgrading relatively quickly. So go as big as you can. We started out thinking that a three to five barrel system would be in our price range, and that would have been true for or any other system. The affordability of the Bruja system uh, got us up to seven, and we're still, uh, I would venture that we're about 75% of the cost of what we would have paid for a five barrel system doing the same components. So the, the price drove a lot of that. And more from my side, 
it's just good engineering design. The modular design of the system, it made all the sense in the world. You don't need separate vessels to do all these processes. You can move pieces in and out to accomplish each step in the process. By doing so, you're actually building in some safeguards against infections, uh, against the excessive cleaning that you'd have to do on other systems. It makes brewing a lot easier, it streamlines it, uh, and you get a high quality product out on the back end. When Greg showed me the Bruja system, I was very skeptical. But once I looked into it more, I researched the brew in the bag techniques. It made sense on that level that it was just a brew in the bag, but expanded and made into a, a commercial grade system. And the more I read about it, and especially when we actually bought it and started brewing on it, good beers were being produced. I was very convinced at that point. So a typical brew day, if we were making our West Coast IPA, actually starts the day before. As we found a good successful brew day comes with a lot of the prep work necessary. Typically what we do, the day prior to a brew day, I will mill my entire grain bill. We have a, a hanging mill, a floating mill that we hang off of our gantry and mill into a bulk bag. Uh, and that bulk bag is what we'll mash into the BIAC with. We will fill the BIAC with our strike water uh, and start that heating up to just below strike temperature, somewhere in the ballpark of 130 degrees, and then we tone back the heating elements to about 25 to 30%. So it's gently heating that overnight to be ready in the morning, and then we can lift that from the 130 to whatever our strike is between 150 and 170 degrees, depending on the grain bill. We will have the colander in place overnight too. Uh, and what that allows us to do is we can come in that morning, raise the, the temperature to strike temperature, and then within 30 to 45 minutes, uh, we're ready to go to mash in. Mash in, uh, we use the, the bulk bag to mash directly into the colander. It simply just pours in out of the bottom of the bag while we have our uh, electric mixing paddle going. We'll then allow the, the grain bed to rest for about 10 minutes uh, before we go to recirc. We've created a nice little sparge arm for the top of the colander that showers the entire grain bed to get a good recirc process going. After standard mashing, say if we're doing the arrow here, the, the mash time is about an hour, it's a 60 minute mash. So we'll go to mash out at that time where we start to raise the temperature on the bed and slowly lift the colander out to allow the wort to drain through the grain bed uh, and, and do sparging. We tend to keep our grist ratio as low as possible uh, while still staying within the generally recognized guidelines for a good ratio, uh, which allows us to reduce the amount of sparge water we have to put in there. Uh, we've had good success with that, so uh, it hasn't adversely affected our conversions or anything, so we feel like that's the best process. At that point in time, we'll, we'll lift the entire uh, colander out, allow it to uh, fully lauder out what is now the BIAC being a boil kettle. As it's laudering, we'll have it set to, uh, to boil temperature we can go straight to boil temperature on it as we're laudering out, and that, that does all the mash out, arresting of enzymatic action anyway, so uh, there's no need to have to do it as a separate step. We can save a little bit of time in there uh, by going directly to boil temperatures, and we found that the, the laudering process and uh, the time it takes to heat that entire volume to boil is pretty close, so as long as we have a good drain on that grain bed, uh, which Rice holes helps with a lot, so I'd recommend in this process to help the draining also. Make sure you've got a good amount of rice holes inside of whatever grain bill you've got going on, uh, especially if you're using wheat. We found that wheat is just terrible for, for stuck mashes if you don't have a good amount of rice holes in it. There's probably about 20 minutes in between the time when we're finished the, the lauder to when we're at boil temperature. Uh, and what we do in that process is we'll, we'll move out the entire mash colander, pull it out, allow whatever residual uh, strike water, uh, if we are slightly over, to drain out uh, over our trench drain. While we move into position, the, the pressure lid uh, for the system will hook up our uh, condensing fan unit to it uh, and the, the flex tube to the, the pressure lid. Uh, and this way we can limit the amount of steam we're releasing uh, during boil. Uh, we do boil with the, the pressure lid uh, over top and placed directly onto the vessel to help trap that and also increase the, 
the efficiency, we can then turn down the elements uh, to about 40% and hold a good boil at, at 212 uh, with the lid on. So that, that allows us to uh, decrease the, the power utilization through the, the boil. For one of our IPAs, we have uh, two hop spiders that we'll use. With the two eight gallon hop spiders, uh, that was sufficient to handle any of our, our boil additions for even our, our biggest IPAs, uh, our West Coast and our double. And we get good extraction uh, with those guys. So no need to go bigger and, and do something else. And we can manage those by hand. Once the boil's complete, we will chill with groundwater uh, for say the first 100 degrees of it until we get down to about 110 degrees and then we'll switch over to a chiller, decrease the time it, that knockdown takes to get from 110 to the, the pitch temp of somewhere between 50 and 70. We are planning on putting in a large 300 gallon tank that will sit inside of our cold room to also help facilitate that chilling because uh, that, that process does take a little bit of time. Uh, if we can get slightly colder water coming out of our cold room, uh, then we believe that we can knock down that, uh, that time a fair amount and get to, to pitch a lot faster. That's it, we, we get that chill down, it's time to pitch. We roll the uh, conical out of the brew house area where our gantry is and into our fermentation area uh, where it can sit for anywhere between two to six weeks, depending on what we're making. Once fermentation is complete, uh, we are using it as a bright tank and carbonating inside the vessel. Uh, so we will then go to, to cold crash on those using the same chillers we use for that final part of the knockdown. Uh, and that can get us down to the mid 40 degree range, which will allow most of the, the protein and trub to uh, settle out of the suspension. So you get a good clean beer. And we're carbonating with a small stone uh, through the bright port uh, on the tank, which uh, does a, a pretty effective job. It takes a couple days to get a good uh, carb level to hit the, the volumes we're looking at. We serve from kegs. After the carbonation process, we will then keg out of the racking port. We have a, a kegging manifold with a couple sand key attachments to it. So we can keg directly from the rack port. It probably takes about 15 minutes or so, doing four at a time. It's about an hour from start to finish on kegging a seven barrel batch. From the kegs, we go into our cold room uh, and to service from there. We found a lot of cost savings with the Bruja system because we didn't have to move everything in. They're modular, they're on casters, they're rolling, so we didn't have to have everything statically set. The install in the other infrastructure that would have been necessary in a traditional system, so with a traditional system, this is all electric driven. If we had not gone with uh, a, an electric heating element system, then we would have been talking about a direct fire or a steam system that would have required either gas line plumbing uh, or a boiler. Um, boilers are hugely expensive in, in and of themselves, uh, so that's, that's kind of cost prohibitive to a degree. Also, uh, because they're jacketed systems, uh, and we can run a smaller chiller individually on these. The necessity for a, a hard plumbed in glycol system wasn't there, so there's some savings there. The labor savings is a lot in cleaning. There's one vessel to clean, so you're not, after the brew is done, it stays behind in the system and you clean it up after the fermentation is done. Where in a, a traditional system, we'd be cleaning out the mash lauder ton, we'd be cleaning out the brew cattle, uh, and then when the fermentation done, is clean out a third vessel. So there's a lot of labor savings in the cleaning that would be necessary. Because of the modularity of the system, there's a good deal of, of lowered labor uh, in the actual brew day process. Whereas to get everything done in a timely fashion, we'd probably have to have two or three people on hand for a three barrel system unless somebody's doing a whole lot of work. Uh, we've pulled off brew days with one person back here on the seven barrel system and it was not too problematic. This is an easily uh, manageable system with a single person. I think the best advice I can give to anybody who's looking into starting something like this is just do your research and try to look at the short term. If you just look at the end gain and everything that you have to do in the middle, it's really, really easy to get overwhelmed and throw the towel in. You know, just keep that vision short sighted. This is what I have to do next. And then when that's done, then you do the next thing. And then eventually you're opening your doors and and making practice batches and it's amazing and phenomenal and <laughs> super exciting.
practice. Get in there, work on the equipment, make sure you're perfecting your beer before you put it out there. Put in the time on the, the product itself. You don't want to put out uh, half-assed products. The most gratifying out of the entire process is when people actually compliment your beer. When you can put a beer out there and somebody says, I really like that, or that was great. The biggest holdup in this whole thing is to just make that jump. If you really have that dream, really chase it. Because it's all over the board. We've, we've done all sorts of marketing uh, ourselves, and I don't think there is an avenue you can leave untapped. I think you just have to be everywhere. You have to be all over social media. You have to get word of mouth from locals. You have to make sure that your name is out there. You have to be at events participate in the community. Craft beer is a community, so get involved in it. Be part of the community. The more craft brewers you know, the more they spread the word. That's what we did down here in this area. Uh, all the local guys we've had conversations with, we're friendly with. They tell people about us when they're, they're at their breweries, and we tell people about the other guys around here when we're there. Uh, spread the word and build the community because there's a huge space in the market for growth.